1863. Desperate men head to Arizona. They wanted gold. They had to have some real grit to make this to survive. Legend has it, one man struck it lucky. This is the richest gold ore he's ever seen in his life. He went by the name of the Dutchman. He finally had something that he was the only one that knew where it was, and he was going to keep that secret. It's a tale of greed, duplicity, and cold-blooded murder. When it comes to gold, people will lie. They say when he died, he took the location of the mine with him to his grave. Dick Holmes and his only son would spend their whole lives hunting for the gold. Their relentless quest became one of the greatest legends of the old Wild West. The search for the lost Dutchman's gold mine. The story starts on a stormy night in 1884. 19-year-old Dick Holmes was joined at his campfire by a passing old timer. Dick Holmes and his father had a ranch in the Bloody Basin country, it's called. One day, when his father was away and Dick was taking care of the place, this man named John Pipps shows up, asks for shelter, Western hospitality, what would pass between the two would define the rest of Dick's life. Pips is drying out from the rain, and he starts to tell the story about an old man that he'd seen in the Superstition Mountains. And this old guy appeared to be mining. After he left, Pips went over and checked it. It was the richest mine Pips had ever seen. He told Dick it contained seams of gold ore 18 inches wide. With the keeper of the mine out of the way, Pips began helping himself. And then one day, the old guy came back, almost caught Pips, scared the bejabbers out of him. Pips felt lucky to get out of there alive. In spite of the danger, teenage Dick was gung-ho to go get the gold. Dick Holmes is the exuberance of youth, and he starts pumping Pips for information, and he gets really excited, and let's go get the mine. And Pips just clams right up. To safeguard the headstrong youngster, Pips remained tight-lipped. But Dick never forgot the tale of the dangerous old timer and his fantastically rich gold mine up in the mountains. Dick Holmes was born in Arizona in 1865, when the West was at its wildest. He grew up near a small but rapidly growing settlement called Phoenix. By the time he was five, six years old, this town was full of miners, soldiers, Indian fighters. That was a time of Indian wars here. So Dick grew up in rough times. During the 1863 gold rush, prospectors descended on Arizona. Some hit it rich, but others blundered into the homeland of the fearsome Apache, led by the legendary Geronimo. You could easily be attacked by small to medium-sized parties of Indians. And one of the big worries was on the foothills of the superstitions, not in the mountains themselves because as you come across that open desert, the Apache would swoop down out of the mountains. In 1875, at the tender age of 10, Dick Holmes signed up to fight the Apache. The youngster helped run supplies to beleaguered army outposts. Later, he enlisted as a cavalry scout and fought with distinction in skirmishes such as the Battle of Cane Springs. 
anybody that was out here in that time period, they had to have some real grit to make this to survive. Yeah, it wasn't for the meek, let's put it that way. Back in Phoenix, Dick Holmes noticed one old prospector who stood out. He looked like all the other down-at-heel miners, but unlike them, this old-timer had no problem paying for supplies. Dick made discreet inquiries and discovered the man was called Jacob Waltz, but went by the name of the Dutchman. Word was he always paid his way, and he did it with gold ore. Anybody displaying gold ore in a small town, well, you know what it's like in a small town. Everybody knows everybody else's business. When the storekeepers assayed the old man's ore, they were staggered. It was 30% pure gold. So if you have a rock the size of my fist, and it's quartz and gold, and one third of it's gold, that's awful rich gold. The storekeeper saw it, and the other customers saw it. Half a dozen people saw it in a small town. How do you keep that secret? There's hundreds of stories that he squandered a lot of money, that he was a drunk and he threw all that. I don't believe any of that. He lived a very frugal life. Dick saw straight through the Dutchman's impoverished old-timer act. He was sure the old man had struck it rich, and he recalled the story he'd heard around a campfire. Pips had talked of an old man in the mountains who jealously guarded a gold mine full of high-grade ore. Dick thought Jacob Waltz surely had to be that violent old prospector. Holmes put two and two together, and it all added up to one old Dutchman. Waltz had the habit of leaving town for extended periods of time during the winter. Nobody seemed to know where he went, and the rumors were it wasn't a good idea to try to follow the old guy. But Dick was determined to follow Waltz, even if it meant heading into the Apache Badlands, high up in the Superstition Mountains. Dick Holmes decides that he'll keep an eye on Waltz and that he can figure out just about when he's going to leave by what purchases he makes in town. And that's exactly what he does, and Waltz leaves just like Dick thought. And Dick takes out after him. Dick tracked the Dutchman's trail for three days and three nights, but was careful to keep his distance. Waltz may have been an old man, but going it alone into Apache country clearly didn't worry him. You gotta realize his history. He traveled out here from California with this big prospecting party. And they were tough as nails. By sunup of the fourth day, the two men were approaching the mountains. Now Dick hoped he'd soon catch a glimpse of the mine that could make him fabulously rich. He can see Walter's fire, the camp in the distance. But Waltz is doing in those days what they called shooting the back trail, which is you get up, you turn around, and you wait to see if you're getting followed. And Dick Holmes walks right into the trap. Dick was braced for a belly full of hot lead. But then the unexpected happened. Dutchman told him, don't, don't do that anymore, I'll kill you. Having slapped Dick down, Waltz carried on his way up to the mountains. Holmes was a very young man at the time, and I think the Dutchman simply wrote that off as a, a dumb kid stunt. Dick headed back to town, with his tail firmly between his legs. Waltz had saved Dick from a date with the preacher, but Holmes wasn't giving up on the gold. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring historians at the forefront of research and debate. 
Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Dick now continued his investigations into the Dutchman. He had always presumed Waltz a loner. Then he overheard a curious tale. It concerned an unusual figure in the man's world of Arizona in the 1880s. Julia Thomas was a woman. She was black and she ran her own business, an ice cream and oyster parlor on Washington Street. Waltz was a German immigrant. Julia Thomas spoke German and he becomes very good friends with Julia. The ice cream parlor was a big hit in the desert town, but then disaster struck. Julia's German husband, Emil, walked out on her. He took almost everything, apart from the debts. Somehow, she finds her way out of debt. And in the court proceedings, it makes it quite plain that people are kind of amazed she was able to do this. You check the records, you can't find where she got the money. Legend says that Waltz helped her out. Dick was convinced that Waltz must have given her some of his gold ore to clear her debts. He now became deeply worried. Might the old man also leave her the whole mine? And then in February 1891, things became even more alarming for Dick. A massive flash flood hit Phoenix, sweeping away half the town, including Waltz's house. The deluge left the old man sick and homeless. Then after the flood, she comes to his rescue. Julia took Waltz in and cared for him in the back room of her store. Dick knew the old man was dangerously ill. Would he now reward his nursemaid by shooting his mouth off about the mine? Dick was well and truly out in the cold. Then suddenly, in the early hours of October the 24th, 1891, his luck changed. Early in the morning, he took a turn for the worse. It was obvious he wasn't going to recover. Dick made his move. He rushed over to offer help. Julia Thomas came outside, recognized Dick, and asked if he would set with Waltz for just a few minutes. She's going to go get the doctor. Well, she doesn't show up for about an hour. Dick now had the Dutchman where he wanted him. All he had to do was to get the old man to spill the beans. Dick Holmes had followed Waltz before. He knew about the mine. Here's his golden opportunity to get the final directions. But excitement soon gave way to mounting frustration. He's with him for an hour. And probably 45, 50 minutes of that hour were taken up with Waltz talking about the history, how he found the mine, people he'd killed, and taking pauses. And Dick's just sitting there going, get to the directions. The Dutchman, it appeared, had other things on his mind. He seemed determined to clear his conscience and give Dick a confession about how he came by the mine. His story began in 1877. Waltz was up in the mountains, prospecting. Suddenly, he was jumped by three renegade Apaches. The Dutchman got away, but only by the skin of his tobacco-stained teeth. He starts going cross-country. He comes across a sandy wash, and in that wash, there are some footprints, and the footprints are not Indian footprints. They were boot prints, not Apache moccasins. Desperate for food and water, Waltz tracked the steps. And he finds a camp, helps himself to the food, 
That evening, three Mexicans come in. The three Mexicans are miners. They start talking shop talk. They show him some ore, and at that point, Waltz realizes this is the richest gold ore he's ever seen in his life. And there was more. Waltz told how the unwary Mexicans showed him their mine. The Dutchman's eyes lit up. He was gaping at a seam of gold ore 18 inches wide. That gold was that rich, and you could find a vein of it 18 inches wide. In today's market, every three feet of that vein would be worth a couple million dollars. Incredibly rich. Waltz was staring at riches beyond his wildest dreams. And greed takes over. He finally had something that he was the only one that knew where it was, and he was going to keep that secret. Waltz greedily worked the mine the whole winter long. Finally, he was forced back to town to stock up on supplies. But then the Dutchman heard alarming news. Two soldiers showed up in Phoenix spending high-grade ore and telling all of town they'd struck it rich up in the mountains. Waltz dashed back to the superstitions. Sure enough, he soon spotted one of the soldiers heading straight to what the Dutchman now considered his mine. The Dutchman was tougher than old boots and made quick work of disposing of the two soldiers. But as he told Dick Holmes, the killing was not over yet. Victim number six was an innocent prospector who had wandered just too close for Waltz's comfort. He basically said, I found a prospector in the general area and I killed him just for safe keeping. The Dutchman buried the body and burnt the unwitting man's possessions. As the old man rambled on, Dick became desperate to steer him towards the only thing he wanted to hear, the location of the mine. But Waltz had one more crime to get off his chest, and it was the most shocking act of them all. With his mine attracting so much attention, Waltz was spending more time protecting his gold than digging it out. He needed a partner he could trust. He wired money to his sister in Germany. Would she send her son over to help? But the uncle and the nephew soon fell out. The old man suspected his new partner was out to kill him. So Waltz drew first. He slung a chain round his neck and dragged the corpse to a sandy spot at Agua Escondido. And he's lying there and he's saying, Dick, I killed seven men for this mine and look at me now. It was this murder of his sister's son that weighed most heavily on the Dutchman's conscience. To try and make amends, he now suggested a deal to Dick. The old killer pointed out a chest at the bottom of the bed. It was where he kept his gold ore. Dick could have the lot if he agreed to something. And apparently an agreement was struck that if Dick Holmes would take the gold under his bed, he had to send monies to his nephew's mother. And if he would do this, it would relieve his mind and his conscience. And Dick said yes, he would do it. With the deal sealed, only now did the Dutchman start revealing the directions to the mine. One of the tragedies of the deathbed confession 
is that Walt's his priorities were getting things off his conscience first and giving directions last. So by the time he's giving the directions, he's very ill and dying. But when he gets to the directions, they're not as clear as they could be. When he finishes, there's only time for a couple of three questions. And Waltz is gone. Waltz supposedly said the mine's in a north-south canyon. Holmes never got to ask the simple question, does the water flow north or does the water flow south? That simple question eliminates 50% of the wrong canyons. Dick never got that chance because Waltz died. And it must have been pretty frustrating. This confusion about the directions would come back to haunt Dick. But for now, he thought he had what he needed. And he had a chest full of gold ore. When Julia got back, the Dutchman was dead, and Dick and the gold were gone. All hell broke loose between Dick and Julia, and the affair remains a matter of controversy even today. When he died, he had 48 pounds of this stuff under his bed, very visible, very rich gold. And while he was dying, Dick Holmes obtained the gold ore. I'm confident that the Dutchman gave the gold to Dick Holmes as a grub stake to find the mine with the understanding that when he found it, he would do what was right. I think he did steal it as he was dying. Uh, when it comes to gold, people will lie. Some will tell you Dick Holmes was a liar, a robber, and a thief. No, he was not, in my opinion. He was a very honorable man. No one knows if Dick ever sent money to Germany, but his wife Ida was expecting a baby and it seems the newlyweds went on a splurge. The story that Dick Holmes got the gold from under his bed seems to be supported because within 18 months, you check the tax records and Dick Holmes' lifestyle goes like this. You know, new wagon, house, mini ranch, etc. Gold under the Dutchman's bed sold for $4,800. Gold was $20.67 an ounce. On today's market, it would be worth several hundred thousand dollars. It was a small fortune, it really was. Julia was hopping mad and determined to get her revenge. She became hell-bent on getting to the Dutchman's mine and the rest of the gold before Dick. She sold up the business and word soon got out that she was planning a trip to the mountains. So you had these two camps, the Dick Holmes camp, and the Julia Thomas camp. But Julia lacked Dick's wilderness savvy. She set out at precisely the wrong time of the year. In high summer, temperatures in the mountains frequently top 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Covering a vast area of over 400 square miles, the superstitions are mainly parched and barren. Out here, death can come easily to the unprepared. Julia was soon forced to head home, but though down, she was not out. She didn't get the gold, but she found one way to cash in on Waltz. She drew up lost Dutchman mine maps, selling them for $10 a pop. Overnight, a legend was born. The Dutchman story hits the newspapers and it's nationwide. It goes from San Francisco to St. Louis at a minimum. And people start flooding into Phoenix and a lot of them come to hunt the Lost Dutchman Mine. Soon all the hucksters in Phoenix were in on Julia's act, supplying any number of phony maps and highly imaginative directions. It's in a north-south canyon on a small hill. From the entrance of my mine, 
you can see the military trail. But from the military trail, you can't see my mind. From the hill behind his mind, you could just see the tip of Weaver's needle. The rays of the setting sun shine into the entrance of my mind. Julia not only produced bogus maps, she was determined to scupper Dick's chances of getting the gold. She now told everybody that the Dutchman had told Holmes the route to the mine. So it's no longer a secret. Holmes now found himself dogged by every gold-hungry greenhorn that had rushed to Phoenix. Dick had to lie low, but at least it seemed none of the Dutchman's genuine directions had leaked out. Waltz said follow the old government trail. Look for a boulder that resembled a man's face. Close by would be a house built of rock. Near to the house would be the entrance to the mine. Dick thought, well, this is going to be simple. Months later, Dick thinks the coast is finally clear. But it's obvious from the get-go, he's got company. Years before, Dick had tracked the old Dutchman. Now it was his turn to look over his shoulder and shoot the back trail. Dick's a marked man. He's the only person with the directions, or claims to have the directions, that he was followed every time he went in the mountains. Afraid of leading rivals straight to the mine, Dick had to turn tail and head back to town. But even when Dick managed to shake off his pursuers, he found many of the Dutchman's directions simply didn't stack up. He's looking for the old government trail. Simple, he's gonna follow that, he'll find the rock that looks like a man. The problem was that there were at least three old government trails. They were used by the army during the Apache Wars. Becoming increasingly desperate, Dick went back to what Waltz told him on his deathbed. So he starts to check the only things he can check in the story that Waltz gave him. And one of them is that Waltz killed his nephew, he killed him in a specific place, buried him in a specific manner. The Dutchman said he shot his nephew, dragged him by a chain, and buried him at Agua Escondido, a place Dick knew well. Dick goes to that place, finds a grave under a shelf, just like Waltz had described, digs, finds the bones of someone, and there's a chain around the neck as if someone had used it to drag a body. So Dick thinks, well, there's got to be a lot to this. The find at Agua Escondido may have been grisly, but at least it confirmed there was some truth to the deathbed tale. Dick now went back to the hunt with renewed vigor. His target now was the major clue, the rock that looked like a man. But a rock that looks like a man is a matter of the eye of the beholder. If you're trying to find a particular rock that looks like, say, a man, it could be an impossibility. And then you might go down a canyon and see three of them, but it doesn't mean that that is the particular man. You go through the superstitions, and there's probably a 1,000 places that have a rock that looks like a man. Dick would also have been disturbed by something else that Jacob Waltz told him from his deathbed. After all the killing, the Dutchman decided to hide the mine from prying eyes. He told Dick he had spent the winter collecting timber and cutting spars to fit over and hide the mine shaft. He then buried the logs under a deep layer of sand and rock. He said after the first rain, you couldn't tell it was there, and you could drive a mule train over it and not know it, and he made it that solid. In his darkest moments, Dick may have realized he could have passed over the gold lying a few feet below him. Dick would go on to spend 
14 long years on his solitary search. In 1908, he finally teamed up with a partner, his 16-year-old son, George Brownie Holmes. Dick gave Brownie the Dutchman's directions and one crucial piece of advice that could save his life. He told Brownie, very simply, he says, if you ever find the rock house, make no sign, walk right past it, like you haven't found anything, get out of the mountains. You're gonna be followed, and don't let anybody ever know that you found something. You can then come back later, more prepared, and go to the mine. And sure enough, when Dick and Brownie set out on their first journey, they take one trip into the mountains, but they never get to the mountains, because again, they're being followed, just like Dick had always warned. So they make a detour and they come back. It was the only trip the two would ever take together. The second trip never happens. Dick's knee starts to give him trouble. And he's getting a few years on him at this point. Dick's Dutch hunting days were done. He was no longer able to ride the mountains. He passes the torch to Brownie. Brownie eagerly set out to claim the prize that had so eluded his father. But it was now April 1917, and suddenly his hunt came to an abrupt halt. Uncle Sam needed men. Brownie, though hungry for gold, answered the call. And he made it through the Great War, all in one piece. And on his return home, Brownie had one thing on his mind. He signed up as a cowboy at the Quarter Circle U Ranch in the heart of the Superstition Mountains, the ideal base for Dutch hunting. But Brownie soon discovered he was joining a band of cowboys equally obsessed with finding the gold. Brownie had returned from France to a different world, and unlike his father, he wasn't up against a bunch of treasure hunting rookies. The quarter circle you guys were hard-bitten cowhands, and they knew the mountains just as well, if not better, than he did. I doubt if there's a cowboy that's ridden that range that either doesn't know the story, want to know the story, and after knowing the story, doesn't keep his eyes out. The ranch hands also had a very different way of working. They wouldn't jealously hoard information. They'd trade it. They would barter any snippet or clue they picked up out on the trail. They hoped by pooling their knowledge, they could land the big prize. Here's the way the Dutchman thing works. You know a piece of information, I know a piece of information. You get friendly with me, I'm friendly with you. We both hope that the other one will give us more than we give. The cowboys all knew that Brownie was Dick Holmes' son. And they knew what that meant. Brownie had the Dutchman's directions. And people asking for help, for a hint, for a direction. But Brownie was pretty close mouth. But Brownie was desperate to find the rock that resembled a man. And with his father's OK, he dropped some big hints round the ranch. They thought that they would let out just enough of the clues that perhaps someone could find the landmarks that they had not been able to find. One cowboy took the bait and told Brownie he had seen the rock that looked like a man. He would tell Brownie where, but first he wanted information in exchange. But they didn't want to tell them enough that they could find the mine without them. Brownie clammed up and wouldn't trade more clues. If the cowboy had found it, Brownie reasoned, so could he. 
But legend has it the double-crossed cowboy got his revenge. He crowbarred the rock, sending it crashing down into the ravine. Whether this is just one of the many tall tales surrounding the Dutchman's story is impossible to say. What was clear was that in the 1920s, Brownie was no closer to the mine than his father had been when he first rode out in 1892. The Dutchman had been dead for over 40 years. It seemed to many, the old man's secrets had gone with him to the grave. The fact is, from about 1900 to 1931, that story almost died. Then a mysterious and brutal act occurred that would blow the story wide open again. The so-called Adolf Ruth case shocked and fascinated America in equal measure. The Dutchman story was back and all across the front pages, coast to coast. In 1931, at the height of the Depression, Adolf Ruth, a man who claimed he was in his 60s but was actually in his 70s, shows up and says he's got a great story and he has the maps and the information that are going to make it really easy to find them on. Like countless other Dutch hunters before him, Ruth arrived at the Quarter Circle U Ranch, asking to be guided into the mountains. The cowboys were well used to oddballs, but Ruth stood out. He'd let slip that he had a map, but this one was different. It was Mexican. Ears pricked up. Everyone at the Quarter Circle knew Waltz had stolen the mine, and he'd stolen it from three Mexicans. Had Adolf Ruth somehow acquired the one authentic map to the lost mine? Brownie heard the news. He decided it was time for a chat with the old man. Brownie later recalled the two talked long into the night. The conversation was all Dutchman. Whether the map was mentioned is not known, but Brownie did warn the 78-year-old city slicker about tackling the mountains now, high summer. But the old man dismissed Brownie's advice. Ruth was determined to go into the superstitions and there was no time to waste. Really, you don't go hunting the Dutchman mine in the summertime. It can cost you your life. The quarter circle U Ranch hands refused to take the stubborn old man. They knew he could die out there. But he ignored them all and managed to find two down at heel prospectors who did agree to take him. Ruth packed his map and grabbed his chance. He gets packed into the mountains. They go to check on him a few days later. He's never seen alive again. His camp's in order. His boots are there. They start looking for him. The sheriff quickly rounded up a search posse. The men knew Ruth wouldn't last long out in the superstitions. Now, he went in at the end of May, 1931. Brutal Arizona summers in the Superstition Mountains. His remains aren't found until December. Music, a black and tan hound, was first to pick up the scent. Brownie was close behind. It was a macabre sight. No skeleton, just a skull, seemingly placed upright. That skull was laid out very close alongside one of the main trails through the superstitions. Someone may have taken that skull and laid it out there, just as a warning to frighten people to stay out of the mountains. The skull had two distinct breaches. There's a small hole on one side of his skull, 
and a large hole on the other. The inquest concluded that Ruth's skull had been damaged when wolves made off with the corpse. But pretty much everyone else had a different theory. Suspicion fell on the two prospectors who had taken Ruth into the mountains, L.F. Purnell and Jack Keenan. Word was they had shot the old man, then stolen his map, but nothing could ever be proven. That indiscretion may have caused his death. He shouldn't have advertised the fact that he had what he thought was a secret map. Uh, that was a big mistake. But it wasn't the end of the story. One month later, Ruth's skeleton and possessions were found, three quarters of a mile away from the skull. And the question has always been, was he murdered for the maps? Because some things were found with him, some things weren't. The maps were missing, but they did find Ruth's notebook. It contained one page that further deepened the mystery. His final entry, Veni, Vidi, Vici, Latin for I came, I saw, I conquered. And below in English, 200 feet across from the cave. Many believe the cryptic lines proved that Ruth had indeed found the lost Dutchman's mine. The suspicion was that the frail old man had been followed to the mine, murdered, and then dragged away to keep the mine's location secret. To the true believers, he found the mine and he wrote those words, I came, I saw, I conquered, Caesar's famous statement. But there is another interpretation of those words. To those who are perhaps more skeptical, it's a known and documented fact that Adolf Ruth had to move heaven and earth to get to Arizona. His family didn't want him to come, yada, yada. I mean, there was one roadblock after the other put in front of him. When he finally got in the mountains, perhaps he wrote those words to simply say, I beat them all. Everybody tried to stop me, but here I am. I came, I saw, I conquered. Brownie Holmes was one of those convinced that Ruth hadn't found the mine. It was still out there somewhere. But as with his father 40 years before, intense press coverage now made his search a nightmare. This story went nationwide. Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. People start coming to the mountains. You gotta remember, this is the height of the Depression. A fabulously rich gold mine just waiting for the finder attracts a lot of attention. The superstitions were once again awash with men desperate to get their hands on the long dead Dutchman's gold and many chose to keep a close eye on Brownie Holmes. A lot of people tried to follow Brownie. Some of them simply ruined his trips when he knew he was being followed. He simply gave it up and went back to Phoenix. That happened on several occasions. Brownie's father, Dick, died in 1933, aged 68. Before passing away, he admitted to Brownie that he could have made a major mistake about one of the clues. The Dutchman had told Dick to start out at the old government military trail. The problem was, there were at least three military trails crossing the superstitions, and Dick later suspected he may have chosen the wrong one. Finally, Dick's long years of failure seemed to have a reason, and now Brownie set out on a new trail. And it wasn't too long before he got a break, and it links right back to the deathbed confession of Jacob Waltz. Brownie was searching the new trail when he noticed the sand had blown back and revealed some charred rags. Brownie recalled an old tale told by his father. Could the scraps be the clothes of the long dead prospector? Waltz said he burnt the man's clothes, 
If these were those clothes, did this mean the mine could be close by? Brownie scoured the area for days, but drew yet one more blank. And out on the new path, Brownie later found old timbers well above the tree line. Could they be the remnants of the logs Waltz had used to hide his mine? Close by, he came across the ruins of an old arastra, a crude device for crushing gold ore. Could it have been used by the Mexican miners Waltz had so brutally murdered? Inconclusive finds maybe, but they gave Brownie confidence that he was finally honing in on the mine. And then one day in 1945, tragedy struck. Brownie's horse suddenly reared and crashed down, crushing his foot. Bugger Red had ended Brownie's active Dutch hunting in an instant. But though Brownie Holmes could no longer ride the high ranges, he still wanted the gold. To realize his lifelong ambition, he needed a trusted partner to go out and search the superstitions. The obvious choice was his stepson, Billy Harwood. Billy sure dressed the part, but his health was not up to the harsh life in the mountains. Brownie now had no choice. He had to hand over the long-held Holmes family secrets to an outsider. Remember, Brownie had been approached by people and hounded by people about the mine for decades. But he met one man in whom Brownie trusted. He became Brownie's adopted son of the mountains, actually. Clayton Wurst first heard of the Dutchman when he was six and had grown up on the legend. Brownie passed the torch which had been passed to him from his father, to this gentleman. And Brownie, when he first took me into his confidence, he said, Clay, nobody must know that you and I are working together. He said, there are times that I felt my own life was jeopardized being back in the mountains with the knowledge I possessed. And he said, Clay, there are people back there that would do you harm. And Brownie's words of warning soon rang true. I turned around and the guy had a crag rifle with a striker back and a safety off right in the middle of my stomach. And I was one scared boy. I had a sidearm, but shoot, he had me. If I'd have reached for a gun, he'd have killed me. Cool-headed Clay managed to talk the stranger out of murder and lived to report back to his now ranch-bound mentor. George Brownie Holmes died in 1980. He'd spent 72 of his 88 years hunting the lost Dutchman's mine. Was Brownie a disappointed man? Well, in some sense, I suppose he was. And yet, I don't think he would have traded those years that he spent hunting the Dutchman for any other field of endeavor. Sadly, Clay never got the chance to tell his old friend Brownie about an astonishing breakthrough he has made. Clay claims he's finally found the elusive clue that both Dick and Brownie spent their whole lives searching for. Oh, the rock that looked like a man, yes, it absolutely exists. It's absolutely there. It not only exists, it's where it is supposed to be. Clay won't confirm if he has found one of the other known clues, the house built in the rock. However, he says he has located two final clues that have never been made public. The last two have been found. These clues have remained a secret ever since the dying Dutchman revealed them to Dick Holmes. Dick then gave them to Brownie. Brownie later passed the clues to Clay, who was sworn to secrecy. This is what I don't want to go into, is the, the clues to the mine's location. 
With every clue finally nailed, Clay thinks he's close to solving the puzzle of the lost Dutchman's mine. We haven't found the mine, but at least we've found a place in which to search. Small area or not, the Dutchman hid his mine well. Clay now plans to use 21st century metal detection technology to pinpoint the 18-inch wide gold seam, last seen in the 1880s. But even if Clay finally announces he's found the long-lost mine, many will dismiss his discovery out of hand. They've heard it all before. Well, it's probably the most found lost mine in the world. If, if somebody was out there in the superstitions and found what was called the Lost Dutchman Mine, and they had neon lights blinking, this was the Lost Dutchman Mine, and the gold was still dripping from the walls, it wouldn't stop anybody from looking from the mine, because that can't be the Lost Dutchman. But you know what? No matter what you say, no matter what I say, no matter what somebody else says, they are going to hunt for the Dutchman forever. It's a legend, and that's what a legend's all about. In the late 1800s, a young man called Dick Holmes heard a story that made him take off to the mountains to seek out his fortune. And with each passing generation, people come to Arizona and follow in the footsteps of Dick Holmes, searching for the lost Dutchman's mine, chasing one of the greatest tales of the old Wild West. <laughs>